But we, as a, as a reminder, uh, the incubator meeting is coming up soon. They send the invite already. Uh, I think it's uh, in about two weeks, less than two weeks. Um, just make sure that if you don't have the invite, ask us so we can share the invite. And um, it's going to happen right before the next committee meeting. And we're trying to get the ball rolling. If things go well uh, in the meeting, then we already add a, an item into the agenda for next meeting for stage three. Okay. So that's stage three on realms. Yes. Uh, yeah, there's also um, uh, been a meeting that um, another uh, pre-TC39, TC39 relevant meeting, which was the meeting of the group uh, interested in uh, built-in modules. And there's a particular political issue that uh, came up there that's also going to affect the incubator meeting. Uh, which is built-in modules uh, wants to go to stage two. In order to go to stage two, uh, they need to uh, have an approach to the remapping of the, of the import namespace. Uh, and they're currently reluctant to have that depend on compartments. They're reluctant for a number of reasons, but the killer reason is that compartments are at stage one and they don't feel like they can go to stage two and depend on compartments while compartments are at stage one. So we really need to advance compartments to stage two, uh, but that's um, uh, more usefully talked about if Bradley was on the line, since Bradley is the author of the proposal that we go to stage two. But I do expect it to be an issue at the incubator. Uh, Mark, Rudy, do you have the you date explain? of the incubator handy? Say that again? Do you have the date of the incubator meeting handy? Uh, yes, I think, uh, let me look at it in my calendar. Um, yeah, on that topic, uh, yeah, when, when Bradley gets back, we should discuss what we can do to uh, streamline the compartments proposal, streamline or polish this compartments proposal um, to make it suitable for advancement to stage two. Mm -hmm. so the incubator call is on May 26th. And, and the time of it is noon for me, which is 9, uh, 9 a.m. for Pacific. Okay. 9 to 10. You should have Good. the invite. I will be there. Yeah, I will be there. Karidi, are you in Eastern? Yes, in Miami. Uh, the other note is that uh, we we now have um, Leo Balter, Leo Balter working uh, at Salesforce. Oh, and great. One of his primary goals will be get the realms to stage four. So he will be, he will be able to write the test. He will be able to write whatever needs on the spec, on the DOM. So that will be a major, I think a major um help that we'll get um in the upcoming things that we need to do for it but um great we just need to get the the right the, the green the green light uh, we, we get the green light we move forward this is mm -hmm. me salesforce is also going to be one of the supporters of test 262. uh i think yeah most likely we'll still be working on that Yeah, the uh, Leo has been a tremendous part of the momentum of Test 262. So hopefully he will continue to be able to yep. do that. But uh, yeah, that's great that's, um, that Leo is part of this. Uh, did I spell Leo's name correctly? Yes. Um, yeah. Yes. 
All right. So to advance it from stage three to stage four, uh, you require uh, it to be implemented in at least two, I believe the current rule is at least two browsers. Uh, and hopefully we can uh, uh, general, uh, all, at some point alter the rule so that non-browser JavaScript engines are less second class. Yeah, is there anything we can, uh, is, is, does it look like we're on track for that? <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I, I assume that we're at around zero at the moment. Uh, right now, um, uh, the uh, realms is at stage two, and we're trying to get to stage three. I see. I see. And at stage three, it becomes more of a uh, yeah, getting getting volunteers from browser uh, volunteers from browser implementations is easier. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Okay, let's see. Um, let's go back to the agenda. Let's see. Um, uh, public global module names for Oh, yeah, so we have a naming discussion about uh, static module record, which I think we before, should have Chris, Bradley present. Before we jump into that, I was I was asking Mark, uh, if he can provide more details on and the uh, built in module uh, discussion because I wasn't there. Oh. Yeah, um, the so there there's uh, there's some things that built-in modules have to solve, or at least that it would be uh, very desirable to solve, uh, where these simultaneous uh, desires uh, are uh, in tension with each other, and we don't have currently. Uh, one concrete proposal that solves all of them. Um, uh, so one is that the things that are available in built-in modules are available uh, to, uh, inside uh, HTML script tags synchronously uh, so that um, uh, they're not uh, uh, they don't consider uh, dynamic import to be an adequate way for scripts in the, the browser to access them. Um, uh, and if the modules are actually built in, uh, it's easy to see that having some way to access them synchronously uh, uh, doesn't seem um, uh, impossible. Uh, Calbert made a uh, suggestion that everybody seems to like a lot, when, including myself, uh, which is uh, to introduce a new name into lexical scope, like import now, uh, where uh, it, its argument is a uh, specifier string. And the outcome of calling it with a specifier string is either that it returns a module namespace object um, so that the caller of it can you know, use it directly for pattern matching if, if it succeeds, or as Calbert is typing ahead, or it throws if the uh, built-in module is not synchronously available. Um, uh, so, uh, so for synchronous access from scripts, uh, that seems like a pleasant, pleasant direction everybody's happy with. Um, uh, the other, uh, another uh, uh, desire or requirement, depending on who you talk to, uh, is that um, uh, built-in modules be shimmable, uh, shimmable in two senses. Uh, one is that, uh, that a shim be able to add a built-in module to a platform where, uh, where the platform itself does not yet know of the, of the, the existence of that built-in module. So it's the normal thing of shims being able to, um, uh, when they can be coded in the language, uh, to be able to uh, make future versions available on past browsers. 
the other notion of shimmable is to modify the behavior of an existing uh, built-in module, uh, presumably by intermediating, uh, where the intermediation is done uh, by uh, remapping the import namespace. Uh, and then uh, there's this existing browser precedent that uh, is taking people's thinking uh, in a particular direction, which is there's currently uh, a set of HTML uh, tags, um, uh, which is not a JavaScript API, but rather something that has to exist in the HTML prior to the execution of, every, of any JavaScript, which is uh, a feature called uh, import map. And the, the other proponents of built-in modules, uh, meaning um, uh, uh, Michael Saboff and um, uh, Keith Miller, uh, both from Apple, are uh, going in the direction of proposing a JavaScript API to modify the import map uh, of the, the, that's experienced by the code that is already necessarily running because it's being accessed from an API. I think there's a more stratified way to look even at the precedent that exists, which is that the precedent, that the things that the HTML says declaratively before any code starts running can be thought of as uh, uh, a controlling expression uh, that affects the behavior of controlled code, which is the code that necessarily only starts running after that declarative thing is processed. Uh, so the, the, the direction that everybody understands um, and, uh, and is uh, primarily resistant on because of this stage coupling, but not only for that reason, um, uh, is the notion that we adopt in general as a architecture that uh, things like uh, determining an import namespace is one where controlling code determines the import namespace seen by controlled code. And the controlled code doesn't even know that it's in a remapped namespace. It's just born into the namespace determined by the controlling code. In the browser, uh, this requirement is not, is not only on the JavaScript, it's also on HTML that, that contains JavaScript. Uh, so how to generalize that controlling versus controlled principle so that it applies to JavaScript inside HTML tags uh, is um, uh, something that, that that was the first meeting where we started talking about uh, possibilities there. And we definitely, and I, I proposed one in particular that was kind of iframe-like that people either didn't like or didn't understand. Uh, but in any case, I think we'll continue to run into resistance. So that's part of the problem we need to solve is to explain what this controlling versus controlled perspective looks like when extended from just JavaScript uh, into uh, uh, a, a more overall browser integration. Uh, unless we have a good story for the browser, the browser browsers are just not gonna go with uh, 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 this as the solution for JavaScript. Um, I still don't get what the problem is and where the, these two these two proposals are touching each other. Um, import now seems fine if, if it's a global name, most likely. Import 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 now is 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 itself fine. Uh, the 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 tension that it creates is that. It has to be able to appear in a script tag in 
the HTML of the, the, you know, the main document for some meaning of main document uh, and the thing that it has to be able to import has to be able to be code that came from a shim where the code, where the shim itself is only loaded asynchronously. So that creates a tension between the asynchronous availability of shims and the synchronous availability of what seems to be built in modules and the scheduling of the execution of script tags in a browser. So those are the three things that have to be brought together. So how is this different from polyfilling anything today that patches some APIs? Uh, the polyfill uh, is able to... Let's say I, I load a polyfill that change Intel number format or something like that. Right. So the so the poly, the polyfill operates on the environment in which it is running, and that's because of the pervasive mutability of the JavaScript primordials. Uh, the uh, operating on the import namespace of the environment in which you're running is where these guys want to go, and I think it would be a disaster. Um, uh, you've got code that's already running. It's already running in some import namespace. I don't think it should be able to modify the import namespace it is already running in. Um, uh, but that would be the, the precedent that follows the logic of why shims today can modify the primordials. Yeah. Um, Is there are... Is it the assumption here that the the way you polyfill one of these or shim the, one of these, um, I'll say polyfill one of these built-in modules is by replacing import map import now with a new implementation of import now that give you that? I, I'm still confused about what. Uh, the that, is okay. So the, uh, that possibility of actually replacing the import now as part of polyfilling actually had not occurred to me. That's interesting. Because it's just a global that's in yeah, scope. It's a global name, you change it, and then that one wow. returns something new. That is really fascinating. And that way, you're not changing what is, in any objective sense, the import namespace yeah. of the code that's running. It's yep. just the import namespace seen through import now, but the, it would, okay. And then import now would, would still, would have the, 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 the modified import now in order to load modules that could themselves just use import declarations to load other shimmed modules uh, would have to, still experience, so I, th I think there's still an issue here, which oh, is you could issue, replace, you could I, I replace what, the import. Go so ahead. What, what I'm trying to say is that this is not different from any other polyfilling. Whether, no, you, load it, so, whether you load it, you load everything up front um, uh, because you know that they will call import now for, I don't know, um, CMD or some other built-in modules or whatever, um, you need to load those things up front and that's, you, you don't know what they're going to use to call that or you figure a way to provide some sort of scheme around it, like a, a, some sort of a proxy around the thing that you return or something. Um, I, think you, I, I think you would pretty much need the compartment mechanism or something like it because the import now would have to be able to run modules that just use import declarations where the import namespace seen by those modules to satisfy their import declaration is determined by the shim. And uh, in order for that to be an emulated uh, import namespace, um, you either have to do a complete emulation of 
uh, the module importing uh, module importing mechanism, like the current compartment shim is doing, and that's too painful to um, to just do manually, um, to ask people in general to do manually. It's the whole compartment shim, uh, or you need the compartment support so that the import the shimmed import now can use the compartment to set up the namespace seen by the modules that it loads. What? So why do you think that import now has to give you a real namespace? Because it's going from import now you're going to load module text. The module text has um, uh, import declarations. Um, the import declarations have to be in the namespace set up by the shim. I think uh, I, I find this idea of uh, adapting or uh, uh, I pardon adapting import now to create a new import now that's aware of a new name is an interesting idea. Yeah. Um, it has the I think that the point at which it falls apart in my mind is that um, it's creating a new import now. How do you make that import? How do you make the namespace that it knows about available to uh, import declarations of any module you load? And um, is it because it's sufficient to have an imp It's sufficient in the scope of a particular script to replace import now on the global. Um, but it is not sufficient to then be able to say dynamic import another module and for the module you're, you're dynamically importing, uh, 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 be able uh, uh, to uh. access the names of the namespace that you've created. So that, yeah. in order for this to work, yeah. you would need to have some kind of mechanism uh, on the inside of a compartment to um, modify the name side uh, in the compartment, from a name, the namespace of your compartment from within. Um, and that takes the shape of either of the proposed uh, set import map function um, or uh, with, with caveats. I think that the set import function is doomed for a number of other reasons. But, um, but if you were to even just reduce it to its, uh, the, the, even if you were to reduce it to the simplest form, which is just a function that says, hey, from within this compartment, I introduce this built-in module with this name. Um, it, even in that case, it needs to be something in cahoots with the surrounding compartment. Still very long. Yeah. I'm mean, still very, very, very long. Let, let, let me focus in on one particular thing uh, that uh, Calbert said that I think is the uh, the easiest way to highlight the problem that this doesn't solve, which is uh, scripts already can use dynamic import. Dynamic import is not uh, a lexical variable. It's a it's a um, uh, it's syntax. It's a special form. Uh, right now, it goes directly to the host. Uh, and the uh, what we're doing with compartments at the JavaScript level, but but till now, never thought about at the HTML level, uh, is by creating a new compartment. You you in the new compartment has a new uh, import hook, uh, as well as new import now hook, and that way controlling code can can uh, can can provide the namespace that the controlled code, the code inside the compartment, sees when it does a dynamic import expression. Uh, if you do just the sequential execution of script tags uh, with a replacement of import now those same scripts can still use dynamic import, but the earlier shimming code has no way to change what namespace that dynamic import sees, right? You have to, you'd have to replace both the namespace seen through import now and the namespace seen by dynamic import and the namespace seen by, by import declarations in the module cell loaded. And I don't think it's viable to do that in the context of the code that's already running. Yeah, and if you did reveal that kind of mechanism, you would introduce a number of hazards. Um, I, like you would lose the invariant that 
um, importing the same name always gives you the same exports namespace. Right. So I'm, I'm still confused because let me try to see if I can explain why I'm confused. Okay. So there are two things that you most likely want to do on a standard library that is provided, whether that's a built-in or is a global accessible API. There are two things that you might want to do. You want to replace it entirely uh, or pieces of it, or you want to introduce something that is not there. Mm -hmm. if, so, yeah. If, if yes. you are doing a built-in module, which offers you APIs to do some operations, you most likely will have the same kind of thing. Sometimes you just want to add one thing into one of the prototypes that are accessible via one of these built-ins, and you should be able to do so by just doing import now and changing the pieces of it by adding um, uh, new things or changing things that exist in the proto prototypes of those things that you access via the import now. Um, the, there are limitations there, of course, because if you're getting a namespace object back, the namespace object is not mutable. You cannot add a new thing that this library export. Right. Similarly, if you're trying to import something that wasn't there before, because it's not supported in a browser yet, you have to create a, a or produce a namespace object that is brand new, that has never been seen by by uh, this uh, this uh, window, uh, this realm running in, in a browser. Um, but in order for you to achieve that, you have to have the ability to either create synthetic namespaces, namespace objects, or having a way to uh, produce something that looks like a namespace object that can be seen or used by some, some uh, by, by whoever calls import now. I would say that probably that second option is not really an option. You really need to have a namespace object that you can hand it over to someone. Um, and the compartment API has some of that, as far as I can tell, the ability for you to produce a namespace object that you fully control somehow using some APIs to, we, in the past we call these the, um, what was the name that we use? Dave, Dave Herman used a, a name for these, uh, the um, reflective module uh, API or something like that, I remember. But the ability for you to create a namespace object. And if you do import now, you're going to get one of these things that are, that are implementing the new API. Um, mm -hmm. So up to that point, because this is observable only at the script level, everything seems to be fine. What I understand that you're saying is that because you have all the means to access the same namespace object, there might be some inconsistencies that you will be able to, to uh, observe. Yeah, let, let, me, let me just focus, fo focus more concretely on the same thing I was trying to focus on, because I think it's impossible in this scenario. Um, uh, let's say that the browser already has a built-in um, uh, named temporal, but it's not right in some way. Maybe, maybe there's a new version of temporal, uh, uh, and uh, you can't get make it right by using the same instance and just modifying the objects. Uh, what, you, what the shim wants to do is uh, uh, load a new module to occupy the name temporal where the new module is implemented in terms of the old module. So this is our attenuation scenario, but this is uh, applied to shimming. So the, the shim is able to uh, uh, import the old built-in, genu genuinely built-in temporal, uh, and it uh, makes use of it in order to export a new thing that other code executing after the shim or in the environment created by the shim 
uh, it, when, it's, when, when that new code says import temporal, it should see the, it should see the temporal module created by the shim. Uh, and therefore it needs to be uh, uh, the thing that is seen through the import namespace, uh, whether the import namespace is accessed by uh, the import now or accessed by a dynamic import expression or accessed by an import declaration in any of the modules that are loaded. Uh, and the, um, so now the question is, how does the shim change what the name temporal maps to? If we, so the, the, the word shim there throw me out a little bit, but I assume that you're talking about the import now shim. No, no, that's, that's, my, that's my point, is I'm talking about uh, if temporal were made into a built-in module, and then somebody wrote a shim. Oh, okay. A shim of temporal. Up, okay. Shim, shim of temporal. Of temporal. Okay. okay. How do you write a shim of temporal where the shim is is cannot achieve its goals by modifying the objects of the existing temporal uh, built-in instance, but rather needs to install a new module such that. Uh, all of the things affected by the shim, all of the things running in the environment set up by the shim, when they import temporal, they see the module installed by the shim. That's the problem we need to solve. So it, it, let me let me see. So you have to be a little bit crafty, but um, assuming that observing difference between the import now name and space and the naming space that you can get by doing a regular import or a import statement uh, is not an issue. I'll say that you have to be crafty to produce a name space when you do import now. That no, I'm saying it's a requirement that any way of importing for the code that's in the environment that the, that the shim was trying to set up whether it uses an import declaration, a dynamic import uh, expression, or an import now. All ways of importing in the code that, that the, uh, that's executing in the environment that the shim was trying to um, produce. You know, the shim is trying to create an environment that emulates the future version of import now. And that means everything executing in that emulated environment when it imports in any way has to find that the import that the specifier name temporal leads to the temporal module installed by the ship. So you're saying it, it must be a requirement that it's triple equal if you do regular import yes. or import now. Yes. Or as well as import declarations. And your argument is that you only will be able to do so if you have the compartment API. That you, only if you have the uh, the compartment API, and uh, if it's a requirement on on HTML that we somehow extend the philosophy, so that we can talk about the um, the environment of code that the shim executed in uh, that had access to the original built-in temporal versus the environment. Uh, that uh, the the uh, the emulated environment that the shim, that the purpose of the shim was to create, uh, so that a script tag in HTML that's supposed to be seeing the emulated environment sees only the 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 mapping from the import uh, uh, specifier temporal to the temporal module determined by the shim. That was a tremendously awful run on sentence. Did you follow it or should I try to try again? I think I follow that. Uh, it, it, it seems weird to me that 
at first glance, obviously, I haven't read many, uh, many things about any, anything about this so far. It seems to me that it's weird that we're using the namespace object as the thing that represents the built-in module. Um, in other words, I don't see the namespace object as the built-in capability that you are accessing. I see it as a mean to access that capability, but not the capability itself. So of course, if we call it import now, that looks a lot like import, and therefore probably you expect a namespace object. But if you want to access the capabilities in a form that is not necessarily a namespace object, you just want the capabilities, you don't care if it is a namespace object or not, then you eliminate this problem entirely. And so, so, so I don't understand that. Let's let's say that you relaxed it that way, where it can be a different namespace object, but it should still be an an instantiation of the code installed by the sim by the shin. The right. original, um, the original built-in temporal should that the behavior of that code direct access to that behavior should no longer be possible in the emulated environment. Could I uh, try to just um, uh, give a different uh, point of view to look at what a namespace object is? Um, so uh, we use a namespace object because it's nice to spec it around that, but what it really does, it says, here are some bindings, one-way getters. Um, some of them will uh, be uh, temporally uh, invalid if they're accessed before that namespace object has a status that it has been um, uh, initialized. Um, so, so it's a different kind of uh, temporal dead zone. If the getter exists without a uh, status referring it, um, then, then you would assume there's only one kind of temporal dead zone. Um, and that is before the getter existed. Um, but um, if you use the namespace object, you simplify how you write your specs in 2015 uh, by saying that has to be initialized to imply that the scope of that getter has been um, initialized. And so, so the cyclic problem um, was specced out that way. Um, I don't think we need to give too much attention to, to uh, the namespace object the way it is specced, um, but rather to what it guaranteed. And if you access a getter before its namespace is, um, is set to initialized, um, that behavior, I don't think you need to follow the exact same behavior in the spec, or you may, you may want, but it's not, it's not a mandatory um, uh, thing to behave exactly as how a getter on a namespace object would. Okay, so the, the thing I want to focus on is let's 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 drop the namespace object for a moment. We have to come back to it, but let's drop it for the moment and just talk about what behavior, what code behavior you see when you import temporal. Uh, and our requirement is that all code, including in script within script tags within HTML, all code that's executing in the environment that the shim was supposed to create, uh, that no matter how it imports the specifier temporal, and no matter what namespace object, uh, you know, triple equals wise, uh, no matter what namespace object it gets, that the behavior that it sees is the yep. behavior produced by the shim. So I still don't yep. understand how Caridi is going to solve that problem. So yeah, that, that one is not is not not really a problem. You have to be crafty, of course. Like you have to replace the import now equivalent. Let's say it's a different name because it doesn't return a namespace object. You have to replace that one. So when you how do you it, replace it? How how do you replace it so that the import declaration sees the replacement? So there's a way. So if you're, 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 you need to bring the polyfill. The polyfill is a bunch of code that you run before you run any other code. Yeah. yeah. That, what does the polyfill? Code, what does the polyfill do to replace the binding of the import name? Yeah. So the, the polyfill 
in this case will replace import now function with a new function. Okay. And when you call it, that returns the new yeah. version of the thing, which is not a namespace, but it looks like a namespace, let's say. Sure. Okay. Uh, that one I get. It, it also introduce or insert a, a, a map for the, an import map for the names that it had to replace, which in this case is the temporal saying okay. that's important when you look for it. Okay. This is the one that you need to use. Right. And that's, and that that's one, the, yeah, that that's one, the entire issue right there is, is what does it mean to, to, to do that import map replacement? Right. When you import, when you do that, you're going to load that script. When someone imported statically or dynamically, it will go and fetch that thing. And when you fetch that thing is a, basically a shell. Is a thing that what it does is just simply exporting the things that it's getting out of the current global. It gets it gets the things that were installed somehow by the by the by the polyfill that is giving access to the tempora bits that you need to export, and you just export them. So that way, it, how does it? That the the the, in the environment in which the shim is running is one in which the name temporal was bound to the original in behavior. Right, but how you does have the, the shim map, right? cause? If, if well, you they, have the, the import map, map is exactly the the problem. The import map right now is only declarative in the HTML uh, and therefore exists before any code starts running. If you if the shim accesses the is able to determine the import map by API, uh, uh, is it the shim is is JavaScript code that's already running? Does does are you so what they're proposing? What I'm I'm uh, uh, saying I don't want to see is that there be, that there's a import map mutation primitive, so that you modify the import map that you're running in, even though you're already running. Is that what you're imagining? That sounds... Yeah, yeah I mean, can I, we can have I, to talk about uh, extending the import maps capabilities by having some ways to add new things to it and dynamically add new mapping. And um, replace and replace mappings. And replace mappings, yeah. That seems to, to be something that is beyond these uh, this proposal, like something that we, we do want to have. Uh, we just don't have, we don't want to. Could I, could I offer another perspective on this, which is that the existing solution for shims is that they, they can mutate the environment to replace name bindings. For example, if you had a shim for the array class to pick something simple, um, the shim can replace the global array with its own, which is essentially changing the, the, the binding from, you know, when code tries to get something called array, it will then get the, the shimmed array. So that's a mutation of essentially a specifier to object binding, um, which is just a global, a global property or global, um, global variable, but the analogous uh, behavior in the in the built-in modules way of doing things would be uh, a, a, a way of mutating that binding. So if array was a, a built-in module or temporal was a built-in module that you'd have access to mutate it and then the mutation would uh, have effect after the mutation but not before. So it imports after that. So I, I see them as equivalent in some way, equivalent solutions. So if there are problems with mutating the global map dynamically while the code is running, then do those problems also exhibit themselves with the current solution? Um, that would be my question. Um, if they do, then maybe the, we, we can point to examples of that uh, as reasons not to mutate the global map, uh, the, import, the import map. Um, and if there aren't any issues with that, then maybe that's just an alternative, uh, an alternative way of solving the problem um, for people who haven't yet constructed a compartment that they, they want their global code to be existing in a mutable environment. 
I like what you're saying, Michael, because I think that it highlights um, how far we've gotten into the weeds, into the into the crux of this conversation. I think that uh, all of us could get to a point where we're agreeing, and I accept intuitively that it is possible to implement built shimming for built-in modules, either using the compartment API or using uh, a self-mutative API that's more like the traditional polyfill idea. Um, I think that they're both possible, but what uh, the sticking point is, I think, um, is when we get all the way up to CESS, um, all of the mitigations that we needed to make the polyfill style of uh, uh, shimming the environment with use, uh, just mu mutating the global, the transitively mutable global scope, um, need, we, need to, we would need a similar recourse for the module map. Um, but there's a lockdown, there's a point of lockdown at which point the, the binding yes. from the and name and array to the object array can exactly. no longer be changed. Exactly. And that's the point at which the import map would also become immutable, would it, would it not? Yes, so, we, would, we would need to surface a lockdown API for the import map um, but, in order for that approach to be viable. So, sorry, so, so I'm, I'm just going to take it back to, um, you know, when I thought about why the namespace object was very important in 2015, um, you're, you're making loose bindings in an importer module scope. Those are bound variables that relate to, to variables that exist in another scope. So namespace objects have 50% what you're binding against when you're using it in the importing module. And the other 50% is what you're binding from. And if you can get rid of the requirement of either 50%, um, if you're not binding from a scope, in, or binding into a scope, then then um, that restriction is is much looser, um, and technically you can mutate because it's like an exports object, uh, you know, in um, in uh, Common JS, uh, it is an object. And objects, if you want to take something and keep it, you could just destructure them, um, and if that value changes. That's your mistake. You don't use common JS exports by, by destructuring them um, unless you're certain that this is how you want to use them. And, and the same would apply to an imported namespace object, but it wouldn't apply to an imported declaration. Hence the need um, to, to make sure you don't dynamically uh, rebind what it links against when it's statically imported. That, that kind of changes um, um, you know, breaks the semantics of why 2015 modules were written that way. So, yeah. I'm, I'm, I was, I'm, I'm confused about your comment. I'm not sure if you are in favor of uh, what we're talking about or in, uh, against what we're talking about. Oh, I, uh, I take both sides. <laughs> so, like, yeah. I, I honestly don't, don't like, like, I just say that as long as, as long as you can Make sure that you see enough of the details um, to not violate the um, the principle of the namespace object. Um, then, then uh, whatever is needed. Yes. Right. Yes. Uh, I, I think that that um, I think that we could easily satisfy that requirement. Uh, whatever namespace that you register in the module map uh, is akin to the internal. Um, scope of that module, uh, and if you were to import, if you were to dynamically import that module, you wouldn't get the exact same object. You would get a view into that object that would preserve uh, the invariance of a of uh, that an export namespace provides. Um, but let let's get back to let's get back to um, mutation of the module map from within or without. Yeah. Yeah, so, so the argument, so first of all, let me just acknowledge that uh, Michael's argument by analogy is a correct analogy. And um, uh, there's, so I, so I wanna come back to it and see if we can iron out some of the difficulties with it and actually make it a, a, a full proposal we can go with. But I wanna acknowledge that 
Michael and Caridi and the other champions of um, uh, built-in modules, uh, I think are all on the same page uh, with um, doing it from the inside. Um, uh, and and I, I was, and if we allow them to, if, if it goes forward doing it on the inside, then it's, then the political issue also goes away because then built-in modules are not dependent on compartments. You're right, right. And that's the important bit, I think. Okay. So let's, okay, so let me right, bring up- right. With some, the assumption, but with the assumption that whatever they do is possible to control via the compartments once we move forward. Okay. So let, let, me, um, let me bring up an issue that I think we can solve, uh, which is the uh, JavaScript code executes during the, um, the initialization of a, mo of a module graph. Um, uh, so it can, so this, this mutation of the import map might happen while a module graph is partially initialized. So some of the initialization happens after the mutation happened. Um, now, I or think- could be, or, or could be that someone already has access to this thing. It's not even in flight, but it's already done. Uh, so by, by the analogy that Michael's making, uh, uh, if we want to, to, you know, to, to just stay with that analogy of why this is acceptable, um, it is already the case with shims that code that runs before the shim or code that is part of the shim uh, can access the old thing and hold on to it. Um, uh, so... Uh, pr so early code grabbing something that's going to be replaced, um, uh, if it grabs the actual object, uh, that makes sense. Uh, if there's a dynamic import in the air that hasn't happened yet, then there's some ambiguity about whether it's before or after. Um, uh, if it's happening during the initialization of a module graph, then there's ambiguity about before or after. Um, however, uh, oh, and of course, uh, top level await enables um, uh, parts of the initialization of a module graph to be arbitrarily postponed. Now, I think the way to rescue all of this is that all of the module instance linking decisions uh, are already made before any of the code in the module graph starts running. And that, so that set of linking decisions together uh, is um, effectively atomic. Uh, and all of the, and, and all the code in the linked module graph only happens after that atomic step. So I think we could take the consistent position that all of the, you know, that that atomic linking step happens in the import environment at that time. Code cannot run during that step. Uh, and then all code, all, you know, um, and, that, and that determines the meaning of all imports, including dynamic import expressions, um, uh, uh, because dynamic import expressions are special form and they're even referrer relative. Um, uh, 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 so that determines the import namespace uh, of all module code that has already been linked. Um, uh, and it also determines the import namespace of all dynamic import expressions that are already in the air. Does that so, seem like right, a coherent you're... way to, to solve all, all the ambiguity, all the temporal ambiguity? 
objectives. Because what you're, if I understand what you're saying, you're saying that um, the the things that are in flight, by the time we replace the the things in the map or the temporal with the new temporal, um, if there is anything going on, it's fine to have those things to re to resolve to the original temporal, not the new one, because yes. those were in fly. And that's yes. exactly the same that happens with array prototype, which you might be able to run something, but uh, uh, by the time you run it, someone else already replaced it or not. And there might be some people that are producing or using the old API and some people using the new one, and that's fine. Yeah, it's let's just, let's just be, be careful about, um, uh, the analogy would be array, the array constructor, not array prototype, because the well, array, array prototype, is, yeah, the array prototype is undeniable. But yeah, the yeah, array, yeah, the array yeah. constructor can be replaced. Yeah, so yeah. yes, that, that that that's that would follow from the analogy. Anybody that grabs the array constructor before it's replaced still has the array constructor. Yep. Okay. I, I got to concede that this is coherent and it actually is true to the analogy. And, uh, so a couple of nodes, side nodes. So most people who will be using import now or the equivalent of it, just like people who use the import, dynamic import today, um, they will just simply destruct that uh, thing. So they never really hold onto the name is based object they just simply destruct it um the or most people uh, especially in this case that will be sync or not async um and um so i don't think the name is space is really important there i would say let's not use it the second one is what kind of name can we use for that api that allow you to import a built-in module or access an import import built-in module uh, capability uh, that is not saying import. And uh, a, a question around that would be, what is the shape of those built-in modules? Is it a default export or is it a bunch of uh, other name exports and not default exports or is it a combination of both? Do you know? Uh, I assume that, I assume that whatever you, um, my understanding is what we're talking about is introducing an API that uh, introduces uh, that introduces the exports for a particular module to its name in in your own compartment. Um, and uh, what I believe the right thing to do with this is for uh, it to be acceptable to to pass an arbitrary object in. Um, to treat its default property as the equivalent of the default property of an exports namespace, um, and uh, and for any dynamic import to return a promise for a module namespace object, which is a view into that object, um, but uh, be unable to mutate the internals. Um, let me. Uh, I, I think that I think that Mark is at least at the uh, has, Mark has stated that he's at least at the point where he's conceding that it is possible and coherent to have a uh, uh, a notion of how to do built-in shims um, that is coherent with the, the uh, within itself and with the idea of how to do um, shimming on objects in global scope. Uh, yeah, that the that the analogy is a valid analogy. Uh, it's under it's it's understandable um, by analogy, um, and it removes the political stage coupling between the proposers. Yes. So so what? I think having conceded that it's coherent, I have to concede all the rest of it. I think that uh, yes, I think, but I think that we want to not simply give in that far. I think what we want to do is to also make sure that. Assuming that we were to adopt this notion of how to do shims within from within a compartment, um, what else do we need in order to be able to do CES properly in that world? And we've already 
Uh, we've already discussed that there needs to be some mechanism for locking down yeah. uh, module import map. But I think that one thing that we have neglected to mention so far uh, is something that you've previously mentioned, Mark, is that some of these built-in modules um, are capability bearing. Mm -hmm. um, and we need to also be able to uh, create compartments that exclude built-in modules um, or have no built-in modules by default. Uh, so the when you say create compartments, uh, when one, when compartment A creates compartment B, uh, compartment A has complete control over the uh, import namespace seen by so B. We would, so we would need no concessions from the built-in module proposal in order to affect that because that's entirely in the domain of the compartment API. I believe that's correct. Uh, the other thing is that we the the lockdown issue, we need to not only lock down mutation of the import namespace, uh, we also need to um, uh, uh, petrify the state of all the built-in module instances uh, so that none of the built-in module, in, so in, in exactly the same way that we petrify uh, all, all of the built-ins. The shim petrifies the built-ins by uh, manually walking the graph because it's a shim but the proposal just says lockdown locks all of them down somehow. Um, uh, the, the proposed lockdown in this world uh, would include all of the top level state of all built-in modules uh, in, the, um, uh, in making, you know, making sure that, they're all, that, all, that, that there's no, no longer any mutable state left uh, at the top level. At, uh, of, of any of effectively of modules. yeah the top level of the built-in modules because essentially that top level is more primordial state and I think that that's also completely within the domain of the SES and compartment AP, uh, compartment proposals and would not require concessions from uh, the built-in module proposal uh, uh, there's one issue there which is that we extend into the built-in module, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the proposals about what things get to be built-in modules, that we extend the philosophy that we've already, the discipline that we've already applied to the primordials, which is um, that uh, computational APIs uh, are purely computational, that they have no hidden state, they have no IO ability, and then powerful things that bring in hidden, uh, that, that sort of necessarily by their semantics uh, bring in state or IO ability, um, uh, uh, like, for example, uh, the weak ref constructor, um, uh, that those are cleanly separated uh, and uh, uh, so that they can be uh, shimmed or replaced or denied or you know, censored that uh, separately while leaving um, the, co the computational APIs uh, 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 same object identity. So there's no identity discontinuity. Uh, so uh, applied to built-in modules, what that says is that um, uh, we would have two categories of module, but that the default built-in module would be purifiable, you know, have no hidden state or IO abilities, and therefore lockdown could make it pure without loss of, of uh, its purpose. Um, uh, and that there would be a second category of module, uh, which, which provides, which by its nature provides some special magic uh, because that's its purpose, but which provides only that special magic where all of these sort of convenient computational APIs that go with it are, are in associated modules, but not in the same module. But, but I, don't, I don't think that affects the built-in module proposal itself. It, it, it affects uh, TC 39s, uh, um, uh, the issue about what things, about standardizing 
individual built-in modules is that we have to make sure that we continue to obey that discipline. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, I wish that we still had Bradley here because this seems like a good point to move on to. Oh the next no, thing. Bradley dropped off. Yeah. Um, okay. But I think. Um, but to summarize, I think that what we can do next time we have the uh, meet with the incubator for built-in modules is um, concede that they do not need to couple to the compartment API and propose. Um, I don't think we need to propose much, um, and certainly not in the context of the compartment or, or CES proposals. Mm -hmm. I would like to propose that they simplify um, the mechanism they're proposing for introducing names to the module map, um, uh, because coupling it to the notion of import map is uh, is overkill in my opinion. Um, but mm -hmm. other, but that is, but that's not uh, that's not germane. Yeah, I mean the the, we, the proposal uh, we might suggest that they that the API for mutating it learn from the compartment work on API for creating a mapping if there mm -hmm. are lessons to be learned there, which there probably are. Um, but that's not really a stage coupling. I mean that is not a stage coupling. Yes, it's just yes. The we, we we can we can we can alleviate any concern that there's a stage coupling for sure. Okay. Okay. So it sounds like even before the next incubator call, or the ne not incubator call, even before the next built-in module call, I should just send email conceding this point so that the worry about it is is not distracting anybody. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you guys for arguing me out of this position that I was um, very passionate about. Oh, I think that we understand. I think that uh, it would be favorable if software were designed more around the compartment API. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, okay, let's see, let's see, let's see. Uh, do we wish to, in our last 45 minutes, tackle uh, the global contour issue again and maybe get that closer to a resolution? or um, one of these other topics. Um, I do not have the preparation for the topic I proposed for module and load method methods and Bradley's not present. Um, and I think that, yeah, this is uh, uh, any feedback for the module import attribute um, is something that we don't need to discuss today. Oh, right, the mo module import attributes. Yeah, I still I just haven't devoted any brain space at all to that. Um, uh, let's, it sounds like um, maybe talking about the global contour. Go ready. Are you down for this? Uh, let me see. <laughs> uh, sure. Yeah, for, uh, forty-five minutes. Yeah. Okay. Well, let me let... one minute to go to the restroom for, for a second. <laughs> of course. Yeah, let's try not to make this. Uh, I think that we can scope this to a half an hour and give 15 minutes back to folks. Um, I'm sure we can use it. Um, yeah. Well, while we're on an intermission, um, I did go through the list of proposals, Mark, earlier, and it looks like there's about 20 to 25. Uh, uh, Alex, we can barely hear you. Arm and a headset. Uh, sorry, are. sorry about that. Um, as I was saying um, at, at the very beginning, uh, I went through the list of proposals that are outstanding: stage three, two, and one, and zero. And it looks like there's about twenty of them. So even if we wanted to review them um, five minutes per subject, there wouldn't be enough time in a single meeting to do that. So um, we may have to plot a couple meetings just to, uh, or maybe even 
three meetings to go through them all and just take a quick glance at, okay, do we want to focus on this or do we want to pass on it for the near future? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was very, la last time that we did that, it was very productive to have done that. Uh, you know, most of them can be dismissed fairly immediately as being relevant to us. Um, and, and even that um, helps tremendously. Well, I'm, I'm just thinking at the end of this, um, maybe I can uh, send this list that I gathered um, over to whoever is maintaining the agenda and they can cut and paste it. So okay. we can put it in for a future, me a future meeting, not necessarily next week. So uh, Calbert, that would be you. So it, I'll, leave, I'll leave it to you to react. Oh. I have no idea what reaction I need. <laughs> uh, that, yeah, that sounds, that sounds like an enormous quantity of work, but totally valuable. I'm, I, have, uh, a, a, I have a similar piece of work on my docket. I need to review all of the issues in CESS so I know what's going on. Um, <laughs> I'm not yet uh, oriented. <laughs> need, to, need to comb the backlog. Um, so, uh, Kariti, yep, I'm here. What do you remember of the uh, the difficulties that the global contour had last time it was proposed that we might have to overcome if we in, uh, if we entrained it into the compartment API? So there were some concerns from from what I remember. There were some concerns from. Um, I remember Dave Herman's number one that the name is awful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, but there were some issues with the lead semantics mm -hmm. and the cons. Specifically, what level of control do you have? Uh, can you remove things from the contour? Can you add things to the contour? Can you change their value? And um, so that was that was one of them. I don't remember the details. Um, I don't remember if the. Uh, yeah, I think if you open the issue, there might be something there. Maybe I copy something in the issue. I don't remember. Yeah, you did last week. And I think that we, uh, maybe we captured links. Yes. Uh, link the word. Yes. Yeah, we have links. We could go over them. Uh, proposal rooms, issue eight. Hmm. Global contour looks relevant. Um, okay, so, uh-huh. Delete, yeah. Delete is controversial. Um, uh, not much there. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, uh, this is enough. I mean, what, like, I think that I think that we could get past this by simply specifying that the global contour is essentially an append only object, right? Um, well, well, the, that's the issue. Like was one of the use cases that we were talking about is like, I can, I, I can prepare the contour. So when I execute some code, the, the code does something. I can determine the side effects of it and I can sort of, uh, restore the state of the contour so I can execute another code. So in the plugin system or some of that where you execute multiple plugins and then you you want to make sure that the contour is what it is and there's nothing weird there going on. Uh, a so, repo is another example of it in the repo you 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 even even today in DevTools, or up to very recently in the DevTools, you create a cons and then you try to recreate it. It's just problematic. And recently browsers, I think Chrome DevTools, allow you to redefine the cons now. 
mm-hmm. in the repo, uh, in the console. So there, there are some things that have changed since the last time that we discussed this. Wow. So there might be some new, um, some 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 new things that we have to look into of how we do it in the repo. I think the repo was a, a good example. Yeah, the yeah. REPL does certainly introduce many, many a complexity, especially if const no longer means const in that context. Yeah. Huh. And I think from, I, I'm trying to remember, but there were some discussion around how is this contour observable? Like what kind of observability do we have? that might help us to implement some of these semantics without breaking um, some assumptions? Yeah, so last week I discovered this thing called a proxy. Um, (laughs) It was a hell of a time. (laughs) 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 And it seems like you can do all sorts of cool things with it. Um, (laughs) And, so something something as exotic as a, an append an append only record or um, uh, something in which um, it's extensible but once uh, once configured uh, a property is no longer configurable um, is something that's possible to model with it. Um, it uh, so, the, so the const. Const in a, being re uh, reconstantified, co- reconstituted, re- um, <laughs> is uh, seems. I mean, it, it's perhaps a bit problematic, but not terribly problematic. Um, well, that, that's the, that's the thing. Like, how do you know it is a const? Yes, um, I think the only case is the. Uh, I think it's the 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 class. Is it the class const? No, I don't. I don't remember. No, it, 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 it's effectively equivalent to the writability of a property, right? Yeah, the the class declaration uh, and function declaration uh, both introduce essentially the equivalent of a let variable. Only yeah. const introduces a const variable. Yeah, which means that it, which means that you're introducing a property that is uh, non-writable. Um, but if, if you were to have two subsequent evals, the effect on the global contour, um, there, there's no equivalent of a delete in that case, like, right? Um, the property, um, the pro- uh, there continues to be a, a, uh, a non-configurable property that continues to be non-writable. Uh, the config- but, but the delete is, the delete is not necessarily about the const. Is also about the let, mm-hmm. because if I if I execute some code that does a let, that adds something to the contour, and then I have a function as part of that, that eventually uses that binding. If you delete it from the contour and you execute the function, it will throw an error. Yes. So what I'm suggesting is that we should make this non-deletable. Um, and deletability is tied to configurability, right? Well, Mark? it's tied to it's tied to configurability in in one direction. And it's important to always remember this, um, which is uh, if the proxy claims that it's not configurable, then it must not allow it to be deleted. But it's perfectly fine uh, and allowed by the object invariance and allowed by the proxy mechanism. Uh, for an object to claim that a property is configurable, but refuse to configure it, as well as refuse to delete it. It's, it's the things that are binding are only the promises of stability. There's no binding promise of instability. So but I, I'm curious why you think that you will use a proxy for this? Uh, it's, I'm just. Versus uh, a regular object? Well, the behavior, uh, having something that where, having an object where, I guess we wouldn't need a proxy. You're right. Uh, well, we just, the, the, I mean, this particular case, a, a normal object cannot have a property that both 
says it's configurable and refuses to be configured. But why it has to be configurable? When you install the, the binding from the, in the contours, it, it really translates into defining a new property, which oh, pardon. Be I think that a data property on an object as not configurable. So right. yeah, yes, 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 yes. Yeah, the reason why I'm proposing, the reason why I'm proposing that this this could be modeled with a proxy is because the special behavior of the global contour is that uh, any that every property introduced must also be non-configurable, so that it cannot. So that in order to preclude the possibility of deletion, because yeah. creating a hole in the scope chain um, is. Uh, Probably not a good idea. Yeah. So, so here's why having it be configurable, but not be deletable might be desirable here, which is if we're going to model the entries in the contour as properties on an object, then the difference between it would be desirable for the difference between let and const to be whether the property is writable uh, so that then an assignment uh, to the variable name turns into an assignment to the property name uh, but if at the same time to support REPLs we want the binding of the const variable uh, what value it's bound to, to be magically changeable, but not by assignment, uh, then thinking of that as a limited form of, uh, if, 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 you does, if the, the property was non-configurable, non-writable, then we would not be able to change its value because that would violate the object invariance. However, with exotic behavior, we can have the property say that it is non-writable but configurable, but only accept uh, whatever special case of reconfiguration uh, we were interested in, such as, uh, in this case, very specifically, the, it could reject all reconfiguration except for changing the value. Mm. So, so um, it's effect, effectively writable, but it's not writable by the by assignment. It's only writable by defined property. So, I have one question about writability, because up until we started talking about const and writability, I was thinking of this more like you, you're kind of uh, endowing bindings into the scope. That's uh, the idea. And, and bindings, the way you import them um, and the way they would work on a contour, in my opinion, um, kind of are the same because um, properties that you put on your global object today in the browser, uh, they tend to want to be uh, very careful that you don't replace things. They're going in that direction. Um, they, they were replaceable, global scope contamination, all that is like in the past. Um, and and um, so so it, effectively, if you do a const or a let, it doesn't create that property on the object. It's in in the scope. But if you use the var, I believe that's that's what gets created on the global object. Uh, I might yeah. be wrong. No, you're you're correct. Uh, right. But there there's 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 a, some some qualifications there. Uh, yeah. A top level var in strict code evaluated as eval code yeah. um, uh, does not create yes. uh, uh, anything external. But if it's evaluated as global code or if it's sloppy, in yes. both cases, uh, it, a var and function does yes. create a binding on the global object. Yes. So, so the idea that um, the contour would have a delete operation where, where it is scoped onto your scope, um, I, think, um, I think you get to modify the contour in a privileged sense. And, um, and the consumer would basically just see that contour 
uh, variable or, or contour um, contributions or endowments as, as uh, bindings. Uh, in a sense, if you want to modify a global contour value, you could um, not think of it as an assignable property, but, but rather as a function that you, you know, Java style setters, you know, uh, you do an operation that modifies a contour um, a value property for you. Um, but that would be a getter. But I, I don't know enough about the use cases to, to um, you know, um, have us consider why it should be assignable or deletable. Um, maybe if we have some use cases that could allow us to think about this more, um, you know, why would we need them uh, assignable from the consumer side? Um, you're certainly heading where my mind is thinking, and that is um, Mark proposed a caveat. It was like an important caveat if we were if we needed to reify the global contour as an object, and that's a big if. Yeah. For the yeah. purposes of the contour, for the purposes of the compartment API, it may not be necessary for us to reify it at all. We just need an ability to initialize it with yeah. uh, a particular set of fields. And that might be our way around. But before we go deeper into this topic, uh, a wild Bradley has appeared and I'm wondering what we need to do ah. to catch him for a little while. Um, uh, Bradley, how, how, how long are you going to be here? I can be here for a while. I just got pulled into a different meeting, so I dropped. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. I, suggest, no I, suggest we, I suggest we sh switch into the topics that needed Bradley. Yeah, and I'm not sure that whether those exist anymore. Um, so, so let's just review to make sure. Um, uh, oh, no, 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 we do. Uh, one of them was, well, one of them is relaxed. Uh, Bradley, in the discussion we were just finishing up, we um, have reached a concession that the built-in module proposal does not need to be coupled to compartments. It just need, we just need to be sure that there is a lockdown mechanism for um, the module map if it's being edited from within. Right. Um, the, so, uh, that, uh, the reason why that's important, that why, the reason why that would have been germane to you is that we may, we were considering, um, uh, accelerating, um, the compartments API so that we could get to stage two before built-ins did. Um, but we no longer have that constraint. I do think that we could, um, advance to stage two concurrently, uh, uh, and it's perhaps worth discussing what we need to do to get to the point where we can propose that. Um, sure. But that's largely uh, uh, something we have to ask you since it's, uh, it, it, it is, uh, involves uh, your time. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, I think proposing us to go to stage two might be a slightly different topic. We've, I've had trouble getting a hold of some of the Mozilla folks who have stated concerns. Um, they just haven't been responsive for whatever reason. So that's our big go-to before we try for that. Okay. Yeah, well, that's good I, think, I, th I think also we need to um, have some, um, conversa some conversations with Shu, whether in the incubators or just separate conversations. Uh, but without but now that we don't have a stage coupling forcing our hand, uh, we 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 do want uh, to get as much uh, online agreement before we go to the committee for stage advancement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that may involve doing whatever we need to do to streamline the compartment API to make it more appetizing to the committee. Um, I'm uh, let's uh, let's table that for now. Um, Let's uh, either return to the global contour issue, or since Bradley's here and we need him to uh, need your presence in order to discuss. Uh, no, 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 no. I, I had I wanted to propose module and load methods for compartment, but I still have homework to do. I need to um, I need to create a, a, I need to create a, a demonstration of why those methods would be usable uh, useful for um, the purposes of creating a bundler. Um, so 
yeah, again, I, okay, cool. We can return to the global contour discussion. I okay, think. great. Thank you. Oh yeah, so where we left off was do, uh, since we, uh, it, it's, I, do we agree that we don't actually need to model the global contour as an object for the purposes of the compartment API? I certainly prefer that and I don't see any need to do that. I'd never, I never had previously expected to reify it. Um, Karidi, if we did not model the global co contour as an object, do you think that might uh, help us pass the objections that you saw um, with the, the realm pro realms proposal? Sorry, I was mute. Um, you're saying if you if we don't model it as an object, or yeah, if 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 instead of uh, introducing, so for the purposes of the of uh, our motivating use cases for the global for having a way to introduce properties of the global contour, um, we would only need to be able to thread them through the compartment constructor and then have have them surface on the global contour inside uh, inside the compartment. Um, it, uh, I don't think that we need to create an object with that name. Um, and because of that, I don't think that we actually need to consider too deeply the configurability or deletability of properties on that object. Um, it could become, uh, the, the implementation of the contour could be entirely internal to the compartment. and no doubt involve quite a bit of caveats, uh, depending on which evaluation mode you're using. Well, when we, <clears throat> so when we talk about it, I, I don't think we ever really talk about refine the contour. Mm -hmm. It was more about, we give you an API that you can use to interact with the contour. Uh, to observe what is there at any given time and to make modifications of it, control modifications of it. Um, but certainly we can look at redefine the contour as an object. I don't, I don't, I don't know if that's. Yeah, with, with regard to the API, Michael Fig uh, made a uh, interesting observation, which is the compartment already has evaluate uh, if uh, right now the evaluate is just evaluate uh, script, strict scripts as eval code. But as soon as we enter, and that was because compartments so far had, had only been uh, uh, trying to support CES use. Now that compartments are trying to support general JavaScript use and integrate with the full language, uh, we'll probably need to support uh, um, either or both of evaluate as global code uh, 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 or evaluate as sloppy code, in which case that's an adequate API. If you want to introduce something into the global contour, you just do a, uh, let's say a sloppy evaluate as of var x and you've introduced um, uh, x into the contour. And then if you want to get the value, the current value of x, you just eval x. So it's not really clear that given that we have evaluate whether we actually need any more API. And we are <laughs> excluding the weird behavior of window.location, right, from this? Uh, describe the weird behavior because I just can't hold it in my head. Uh, oh, I don't want to <laughs> is it is it really um, window dot location? Is is it really weird? Because it's just like a non configurable. Uh, oh, it, it's not a contour issue because it's on window. It's it's a it's global window, variable issue. Window, yeah. There's there's weird behavior if you assign to a global variable in the lexical scope. Yes, because assigning to location. Um, assuming that there is no declaration between you and the window, uh, assigning to location is equivalent to. Um, right. This, this, 
yeah, this is the whole window versus window proxy issue, but I don't think it has anything to do with the global contour. Yeah, it could only have something to do with the global contour if there were a declaration named location on the contour, right? Yeah, I think it would. I, I hope it would because um, that wouldn't be settable and, and basically any code that calls location equal would throw uh, if it's not settable. Uh, and that would basically just tip the argument the other way that we do want is them it, to be settable. Is it, is it the issue, uh, I'm trying to, so is it the issue on the, of location that, so location is not configurable writable. And in browsers, it is true that when you set location equal something, it does something. Mm -hmm. Oh, it does more than something. It yeah. gives you a completely different, uh, um, um, whatever it's called, like global. <laughs> like, so, I, think they, they, I think what I, from what I understand is that how come you emulate something like that in, in, uh, in a compartment? I don't, so, I don't know if we want to. It is marked out as a willful yeah. violation. So. Yeah, my, um, I think, you know, I think eventually pressures might push us towards being able to emulate it. But yeah, my position right now is the same as Bradley's, is that uh, the whole window versus window proxy thing is not something I'm interested in spending any effort trying to emulate. And I'm perfectly happy with a compartment API, at least for now, in which it's not pop possible to emulate that. So for, 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 for the record, this one, if we have a way to make it, to, to, to create it, and in a, in, a, in a compartment, we will be able to create it from scratch. We could make it not configurable we could make it a getter and a setter, and we could emulate the behavior. So it's not really super weird compared to other things like document all. Oh yeah, document all. I also don't want to be able to emulate the thing. The, if I understand uh, uh, the concern with with window not location is not what the property is like, but what the effects are of setting it, right. which is you the frame is navigated you now have a completely fresh set of global variables, not global lexical variables, just the global variables that are supposed to correspond to properties on the global object, but you have the same global object. The, the thing that's reified as global this is the, um, the thing that's called the window proxy and its identity stays the same even while all the global variables are replaced. Right. Um, but in this case, all, all that is something that might or might not be um, uh, uh, something that you could do. I think for something like location is really about detecting that it changes. And we can say it's still possible to detect the changes if you make it a getter and a setter instead of a data property. May I make one point here? Um, <laughs> Window.location is actually a little bit more complicated as I'm sure most of us are aware window.location is not simply a string, it's an object. Mm -hmm. And so it has a bunch of properties like href, search, mm. um, host, port, et cetera. If you start, if you start setting those, you, it's effectively the same, same thing it, it, as it, it, changing window.location. Yes, it's the same thing. They, they, they have the exact same behavior. Um, there's also that thing where, um, code and scope and, and all, all, all that kind of like go, go away detached with that, uh, with that um, um, uh, global, that, you know, the global proxy or whatever. Um, so so, so you're, you're effectively saying, yeah, there's uh, an underlying global object that never changes, but whatever, whatever code was executing, and if that code is somehow responsible for that location, binding on that proxy that you're saying is no longer the attached one um you know that creates a lot of like disconnects like how do we make sure 
that the actor on the location property itself is not a detached proxy object um, executing in itself. Um, because once you detach it, you have to model the behavior of that code somehow eventually dying out and, and being completely detached from any code uh, in your new location's global proxy. Um, unless you have like magical behind the scene wiring happening somewhere. Let me ask this, if I may. Um, is there a shim on this where we could experiment and write tests to see what behaviors actually happen? JS DOM, I think, does that. I'm not sure, but I would say JS DOM is the closest uh, shim for DOM behaviors. Um, I would hesitate to think they don't have that behavior. They, they, they probably do. But, um, I'm not still confused what the Alex question is. I wasn't raising a question specific. Well, I, actually, I was in the second one. The first was simply to point out that window that location is is an object with some complexity of its own. Um, but the second thing is. But so um, just just so on that point first on that point, location is problematic today just because it's not configurable. And because it's not configurable in a browser, you cannot really virtualize it. But if we create a new realm or a compartment where we will be able to define the global uh, descriptors in slightly different ways, we could make it, we could virtualize it almost to behave as you behave today. There, there will be some observable difference, like okay, well, this is it's not a data. Yeah. property anymore is a getter and setter but is it really a problem the setter doesn't change the location object itself it leaves the proxy with that location object detached and it basically creates a new location object in a new proxy yeah you right. can do all that with the, so, with the, setter. the yeah. setter the setter under the hood does the detaching of all the things related to the proxy exactly. But I, I think that, that that kind of dictates that this property in its uh, proxy, um, uh, you know, in its, as addressable by the proxy itself is, is really not writable. Uh, when you try to write it, you basically just create a new proxy and you put a new location on it and you put many new things, um, including object from which location on that proxy is, you know, inherited. So... Yeah, funny, funny story around that is that the minute you you change location, the code that is still have access to this location object, this location object nulls all the properties. Yeah, uh, I don't think those properties ever go away. They, they, they just become detached from the uh, agent, I believe. So, so you can't do network requests. Um, I, I think you, you stumbled on that with the uh, dynamic importing of a detached global. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah. It, it notes out everything automatically. Like the minute it navigates, it, it notes out all the properties attached to the location object. So it, it's, it's not really useful anymore. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. it's there in memory until, until it dies. Right. What I was trying to get at for the second point is simply um, if there was a shim that we could play with to figure out, okay, what are we actually dealing with and write some tests for it um, to figure this out, that might be helpful. And I might have just volunteered myself for that, considering, again, I have some more time available for this kind of stuff. So, so again, I, like I think the best way to try this would be JS DOM at this point, because um, you could kind of like do the, I want to inspect from within and from outside, I, I believe. But um, it's been many, many years since I looked at JS DOM, so I don't know um, how up to date they are. Um, um, but I, I know they even have like custom elements. And yeah, yeah. We, 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 are, we uh, so my, one of my team is, is the one probably maintaining just done these days like we did all the custom elements shadow dom all that so if you need help we can we can help you uh more than that i may need reminders for what i just stepped into <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm, I'm serious i'm serious 
Uh, yeah, well, if it's too much, you know, if you need like a team player that also needs reminders, I'm here. Uh, yeah, so my bandwidth is really depends on how exciting you make the problem look. <laughs> so, okay. I'm, uh, I'm uh, since we're getting close to the home stretch here, I'm wrapping up the resolutions that we have from this meeting. Um, Good. So, so far, uh, I'm just going to read this back. Uh, we convinced ourselves that it would be sufficient for the built-in modules proposal to use a mutation from within mechanism. Uh, yeah. The test proposal would require some additional verbiage that lockdown would make the module map immutable. Built-in modules need to be would need to be petrified by lockdown, and the compartment API would need to clarify, even though it's implied already, that built-in modules are not implicitly inherited by child compartments. Um, mm. Uh, we also uh, may not need any further API on the compartment API for mutating and observing the con global contour because evaluate is sufficient for all of the operations we need. Um, and I still have some homework for demonstrating the need for uh, load and module on the compartment specification. So on the, on, on the previous point, if the eval is is good enough to observe and set values, but it's not good enough for telling you all to observe the list of things as far as I can tell. Um, you mean enumerating the properties? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah which is important. Point. Which is important for understanding the side effects of a particular piece of code. Like if you run some code, you want to see what that code is doing. Like in certain things in the contour is an important uh, operation that you want to determine or to detect. What, what's, yeah, the, no. what's the motivating use case currently? Uh, we, we, in the past we were saying, we want to execute a code. We want to know what the code is doing mm -hmm. and observing that the code is adding things to the contour is uh, an important bit of information about that, the code that you are executing. Mm -hmm. I, I think that we could treat it as effectively as opaque as closures because we don't have the ability to observe those either. Well, except they have wants to also observe the closure, but that's a different topic. Mm -hmm. the, other, uh, the, the, the other thing that eval does not get you is replacing a const. Um, uh, it would have to, um, mm, yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't think uh, we'll be able to, eval is a good enough to change this, but I don't think it's going to be good enough for, for giving us all the, all the things that we do want. So for me, the question is really, is it an object, a reified contour object, or is it a API that you, Mm -hmm. can use to interact with the contour or is it a hook that allow you to intersect operations against the contour yeah and carry on those operations somehow in a, in in your own user land code then those are really the, the three options that i see moving forward yeah um i think that i think that that's candy at this point um uh at least for um Agoric's motivating use cases uh, evaluate is certainly sufficient, um, but for uh, but for REPLs and emulating other existing behaviors, I think that we can we can revisit this as needed. Um, yeah, but remember when you go to the committee for stage advancement, advancements, uh, it's not really about Agoric use cases. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So I still have some homework. Um, and, uh, and we did not discuss at all, um, the naming, um, for static module record, which was one of those, one of those other topics that would have, uh, that we want to have Bradley present to engage in, but I think that we can punt that to next week. You know, I think that the naming thing is, is, is something maybe just, um, you and I and Bradley can, can just meet separately because it's the kind of endless um, bike shedding that has to be settled. But 
Yep. My guess is that it doesn't need to be this entire group that spends time settling. Uh, anybody, who, anybody who wants to join us for that, but it will be just endless bike shedding. Well, it will, it will end. <laughs> right. Good point. It, just no one will be happy. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so let, if you'd like to join us for the um, it only just seems discussion, it. let us know. All right. I think that we should just let everyone go at this point. Thank you for coming again. Yeah. Uh, be sure to be sure to put something on the agenda for next week as it's getting uh, <laughs> as it gets more sparse. Okay. I'm stopping the recording. <laughs>